Well, I guess Vincenzo had some connection issues, so we will just wait for him to to reconnect, I guess. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, can, you hear me? can you hear me, guys? Okay, yeah, now, now we can hear you. Sorry about uh, the interruption. So I was saying uh, thank you, Madhu, for being here, and you can start your presentation. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to, for the presentation. Um, super happy, and uh, so and thanks for coming and for your interest. So uh, today's uh, presentation uh, is about uh, our paper, uh, which is called uh, "Generalization Guarantees for Continual Learning with Orthogonal Gradient Descent." Uh, so, at a high level, uh, there was a previous paper uh, uh, which was. Uh, orthogonal gradient descent for continual learning, uh, which was more, uh, which was a new approach to continual learning and was more uh, like uh, experimental. And so, in this paper, we try to study the theoretical properties of this uh, of the algorithm that was presented uh, in the paper uh, orthogonal gradient descent for continual learning. And so, this paper is with uh, my colleagues uh, Thank Dom and Masashi Subiema, which are from Mila and uh, we can. Uh, so, and uh, also, if you have any questions, meanwhile, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, so, at a high level, uh, <clears throat> I'll try to present the related works uh, to this paper and why we were, why we think uh, uh, these uh, contributions are important. Uh, then, some background, uh, more. Uh, then, what were the contributions? What are the contributions of the paper? Uh, then we'll present uh, one by one the results or contributions of this paper. Uh, some are most are theoretical and some are experimental. And uh, then we'll present some like outlook for future work. Uh, so uh, just to get started, uh, I guess most people here are familiar with continuing learning. But, uh, so basically, what we want is uh, what we have an agent that uh, learns a series of skills. Uh, so basically, he has to learn uh, to perform a series of tasks. Uh, the challenge is a naive approach. Uh, if he learns several tasks, he may forget the oldest ones, and it's very known. Uh, it's very, very well known as catastrophic forgetting. Uh, so basically, what we try, what people try the problem people try to solve is uh, how to train the agents uh, such that he's uh, exposed the least to catastrophic forgetting which means forgetting the knowledge he learned uh, in the past tasks uh, in this paper uh, so there are many uh, works which uh, study this problem and propose several methods uh, like the, uh, there is a EWC, uh, it's uh, elastic weight consolidation consol consolidation approach. Uh, it's uh, th there is the another method called AGM, and uh, there is there are like many methods. And uh, the one we focus uh, on in this paper is the OGD orthogonal gradient descent uh, method. Uh, it's a paper that was published in AIS Stats uh, 2020. Uh, by uh, Merdad uh, Faraj Tabar. And uh, so basically in this paper, uh, so the motivation of our paper is that for the OGT algorithm, uh, there was no theoretical analysis that has been derived yet. Uh, so in this paper, we focus on studying the theoretical properties of this algorithm. Uh, by theoretical properties, we mean convergence. Uh, what does the model converge to when he's trained with OGD, uh, orthogonal gradient descent? Uh, the generalization guarantees uh, we prove some bounds to guarantee that the algorithm has some error uh, bounds, uh, uh, test error bounds. And we also study how robust algorithms to catastrophic forgetting in theory and in practice. Uh, so these are like this is the main motivation of this paper is uh, studying the theory, the theoretical properties of the OGD approach. Uh, so uh, before diving into the uh, contributions, uh, uh, presenting some uh, background. Uh, uh, so there are two key things to uh, before stepping into the paper. 
The first the key background is the neural tangent kernel. And the second key background is uh, OGT for neural learning, uh, which is the paper we uh, are building on top of. Uh, so the neural tangent kernel is a paper uh, published by uh, Jaco et al. Uh, in 2018. Uh, basically, uh, it's a very complex paper, but the very high level intuition behind the paper is when the DNNs are over-parameterized, over-parameterized means that the number of weights tend to infinity, uh, the, the DNN becomes like a linear function. Uh, before diving into the results, uh, I, um, uh, there is a very nice uh, blog post, uh, which uh, the link is uh, below, which I really uh, recommend you to read if you're interested in this topic. And uh, I just uh, took from this blog post, uh, figures. Uh, so basically what they did, they, they took a two-layer radio network and they trained it with the SGT on a square loss. Uh, so the what they do is they vary the number of uh, weights and they track the variation, how much these weights vary. Uh, so the left figure is they just took uh, like uh, 10 by 10 weights. In the middle figure, they took 100 by 100. And in the right figure, they took 1,000 by 1,000. <clears throat> Uh, what you can see is, uh, if you keep looking at the left figure, you'll see that you can see the change in the weights. The heat map kind of changes. Uh, when you look at the middle figure, it's very hard to tell if the heat map changes. Uh, but when you look at the right uh, figure, it's very hard or impossible to see uh, uh, the weight change. Uh, so this is, I find this a very nice uh, illustration to the concept. So basically, the idea is that if you have many, many weights, a very large neural network, uh, the weights will stay very close from their initial initialization. And that's why on the right figure, we don't really see any change because the weights stay very close from where they started. But on the left figure, they kind of change more because there are less weights. And uh, so we can see visually uh, this change. Uh, this is a very high level intuition. Uh, behind uh, like uh, like the proof of the neural tangent kernel, uh, the actual theoretical result is uh, this. I'll just go step by step, and uh, please uh, stop me if uh, something is not clear. Uh, so uh, what Jaco and Ed Al show in their paper in 2018 is that overparameterized DNNs are equivalent to their linear approximation in the weights. Uh, so. <laughs> The intuition is that, uh, like in the previous slide, I showed that uh, if you have a very, very large neural network, the weights stay very close. Uh, so the weights at time t stay very close from the weights at time zero. So which means you can make a Taylor approximation, which can be quite accurate. Uh, so basically, what we do is just a first order Taylor approximation of the function of the neural network. Uh, around its initialization, which is uh, F0. So FT is the uh, neural network at time t. F0 is the initialization. And we do a first order approximation uh, on the weights. Uh, so, so now, instead of studying a very complicated uh, nonlinear model, we study a linear function in the weights, but it's still nonlinear in the uh, input. And it's a very powerful result to build the theory on top of. Uh, because uh, we can very easily manipulate linear functions to build uh, many theoretical results. Uh, so this is the first part. Uh, so now, uh, since uh, it's just a linear function, uh, if you do a linear regression, you can get uh, this results. So the solution of the, so the TNN converges as a linear function to this expression. Uh, so this is a very known result from linear regression uh, uh, theory. And uh, basically, uh, one key element is uh, the kernel, K. Uh, so this is the neural tangent kernel. Uh, th so that's one reason it's called neural tangent kernel. Uh, so it's a kernel, uh, as you can see. And the kernel is, respect with, is with respect to features. And the features are the tangents of the neural network. Uh, by tangents, I mean the gradients. So uh, the features of the kernel are the uh, Jacobians of the uh, your network. Uh, so let me know if something is not clear. Uh, this is uh, like the, the key um, theoretical results that all the paper is built on top of. So if something is not clear, 
please uh, uh, don't hesitate to ask uh, uh, questions. Yeah, Mehdi, uh, uh, there is one question in the chat uh, that says, yeah, sure. what number of weights can be considered as very large or very less for deep neural networks? Thousands or millions? This is what? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, actually, so the precise uh, bounds, so when they do the proof of uh, the neural tangent kernel, they study uh, how much, how many weights, uh, the ratio of number of weights over the number of uh, train uh, samples. And uh, if you read the paper, uh, I think not the Jaco paper, uh, in some other papers, they draw some lower bounds on how many weights. Uh, so, uh, so like, for example, they can say, we need the number of weights to be quadratic, uh, the quad like uh, the number of samples squared to fall in the NTK regime. And then, then they do some proof. Uh, in this paper, we just, uh, we don't uh, draw this bound. We just say it's like it's in the infinite case, uh, but it's a very good question. And uh, 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 so, if you look into the NTK papers, uh, different papers draw different lower bounds on when are you when you are on this uh, NTK regime. Uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, clear. Uh, um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Is it uh, clear? Uh, yeah, for me it is maybe cows to, uh, do you want to add something otherwise? Okay, right, uh, he says uh, it's all right. So thank you. Yeah, sorry, I cannot see my other screen. That's why it's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so this is the, so the background, there is a neural tangent kernel and OGD. So I explained the high level intuition behind the neural tangent kernel. So now I'll explain the OGD algorithm. So everyone knows SGD for continuous learning. Uh, it's, uh, you basically have many tasks for each task. You do gradient descent and you update your weights. Uh, OGD, what they do, uh, they are, the differences are in red. Uh, so basically, again, you, you loop over every task. Then uh, you have a train loop inside each task. Uh, so you compute the gradient of SGD for task uh, K. And then uh, you do a projection of the gradient or to accumulate to a set. And this set is the set of uh, gradients of the model uh, which are stored in the memory. And uh, basically uh, at the end of each task, you update your sets. Uh, you pick some samples from your train set and you compute their gradients. And uh, you add this gradients to your memory. And this will be uh, the memory you will use to project orthogonally to uh, your weight updates. Uh, this is the OGD algorithm. Uh, it's a very, uh, uh, in the next slide, I'll explain why this actually works uh, in theory. Uh, this is the high level idea behind the OGD algorithm. Uh, so now I'll move to the contributions of our paper. Uh, so um, again, uh, as I said, the motivation of the paper is to study the theoretical properties of OGD. So the first thing we studied is the conversions. Uh, uh, so we find that the continuous learning can be expressed as uh, some linear combination of kernel regressors. Uh, so this results, we use this results to prove that OGD is uh, robust to catastrophic forgetting with respect to all tasks. Uh, I'll show you later the intuition of why this works. Uh, again, this result is only valid in the NTK regime. <clears throat> uh, then uh, we prove some generalization bounds uh, like uh, we bound the error of uh, OGD and the SGD. Uh, all these results are under the NTK regime when we can build the theoretical framework. Uh, then we moved outside the NTK regime and we check uh, how valid our theory is. Uh, so we find that the theory doesn't explain everything. And so outside the NTK regime, we observe catastrophic forgetting for OGD. So uh, the theory works for the NTK regime, but uh, is limited outside this NTK regime. And uh, then we study some uh, algorithm we propose to uh, study how important uh, this variation is and uh, how it impacts catastrophic forgetting. Uh, I'll move, uh, so this is a very high level, maybe it's not clear now, but I'll move uh, step by step on each point and uh, explain it uh, very clear theory. Uh, so this is the first result. Uh, 
So uh, this result is about uh, how do agents learn throughout their lifetime. So F uh, tau star uh, tau is the task tau. At the end of the task tau, uh, we have a model that is trained. Uh, we find that this model can be expressed recursively uh, over the previous uh, models. So basically, uh, uh, this sum here is the model is the model f tau star minus one. The F tau minus one star, and then when we add the train set uh, T tau, uh, this is the uh, model increment. So this is the new knowledge that is added to the model. Uh, so this knowledge increment in green, uh, we're going to study it in detail. Uh, so on the the blue term is a kernel, uh, and the black term is uh, some sort of kernel too, and the red term is a residual. So if I come back to uh, the slides here, it's a very similar expression, uh, but uh, there is a small and key difference. Uh, basically, it's uh, the residual here. Uh, so uh, the knowledge increments uh, is uh, like a dot product between uh, the blue, uh, black, and the red uh, uh, term. The red term uh, is uh, the labels of the task uh, tau minus uh, the, the predicted labels of the task tau uh, predicted by the previous model. So um, what this means is that uh, we trained our model until task uh, tau minus one. And uh, so if we apply this model to our new data set, it gives us some predictions. And we study how much these predictions are different from the ground truth. Uh, so what this says is that if uh, the previous model already predicts perfectly the current labels, uh, this would be equal to zero. So uh, the, there's nothing to learn because the previous model already knows everything about the current task. So this uh, green term would be equal to zero, which means that the um, uh, dark term, uh, black term would be uh, F tau star, would be equals to F tau minus one star. So this residual is a quite powerful term because it measures uh, how much tasks are similar. And if they are the same, basically it's equal to zero and you have nothing to learn. If they're not the same, you have something to learn. And uh, this is what the, uh, the new uh, model, what the agent learns in the new task. Uh, so it's kind of some sort of transfer learning thing, a forward transfer. Uh, so uh, the NTK is the kernel. Uh, so here, uh, the blue term is also quite important. So what it says is that it measures a similarity between the sample and each sample in the uh, train set. And then it does some sort of averaging of the predictions between all the samples uh, in terms of the labels. Uh, so it takes like if a, if a sample is very similar, then the, this term would be high. And the weight of the corresponding residual would be high. So it says that the new model is an average, uh, average weighted by the similarity of the sample to all other samples. Uh, uh, so I'm not sure. So let me know if you have any questions uh, about this part. Uh, this is the convergence part uh, of the analysis. Yeah, uh, no questions? Uh, so the, the next results, yeah there there is uh, a there is a question in the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. Maybe you can read it because it's uh, it, it contains some symbols. Uh, I'm sorry. What is the question? Uh, yeah. Do you want do you want me to read the question or do you, do you uh, have access? To yeah, actually, I don't have access to the chat. I'm sorry. Okay. My screen. <laughs> okay. So Ostapenko is asking uh, in the first equation, uh, shouldn't be there uh, no tilde? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's over, correct. Actually, over turning F, F tau x on the left hand side. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry, it's a typo, actually. Uh, there shouldn't be no F tilde. It's a very good, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll fix it in the next. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so there should be no tilde here, and this is all tilde. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for the feedback. Uh, so the next result is about catastrophic forgetting. So here we prove that uh, OGD is 
uh, robust to catastrophic forgetting. Uh, what it means is that uh, the predictions uh, don't change. Uh, so if we pick some sample, so if we pick uh, tall tasks uh, from k equals one to tau, uh, so we pick a sample from uh, this uh, union of data sets. Uh, so f toe star, which is the prediction of the model after being trained on the task toe, uh, is equal to the same, the prediction of the model when it was trained at the end of the task uh, k. Uh, it means that the model doesn't forget what it learned uh, previously. And actually the proof of this result is very, very simple. Uh, so uh, below uh, it's uh, like some sort of sketch of the proof. So if we do, uh, if we use this results uh, here, write f tau star equals f tau minus one star uh, plus uh, the linear approximation. So it's the Jacobian uh, of f tau minus one. Uh, that product with with uh, the weight uh, difference between the task tau and the task uh, time minus, tau minus one. Uh, so uh, the key here is that when OG, OGD, the OGD algorithm does uh, updates on the weights, it does it orthogonally to the space spanned by this uh, uh, gradients. Uh, so this implies that this dot product is uh, equals to zero because it's orthogonal. Uh, so then it follows that the prediction is unchanged. And if you do uh, uh, rec uh, recursive uh, if you do a proof by induction, uh, you can prove easily that uh, OGT is uh, the predictions don't change uh, from k equals one to tau. So, which means that uh, in the NTK regime, uh, or if the neural networks are overparameterized, uh, OGT is perfectly or uh, probably robust to catastrophic uh, forgetting. Uh, so, this is the second result. Uh, again, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, so here we uh, we did uh, some experiments. Uh, so we uh, so our proxy for over parameterization is the hidden size. <coughs> so we took uh, some uh, NLP and we increased the hidden size of the middle layer. Uh, the small hidden size means the neural network is the least over parameterized. And the large uh, hidden size means that the neural network size tends to infinity. And on the uh, vertical axis, we track how much the train accuracy changes. Uh, so, which is kind of a, which is a proxy for catastrophic forgetting in our uh, result here. And uh, we did this experiment on three data sets that were muted uh, on three uh, set settings: permuted MNIST, rotated MNIST, and uh, split sidecar. And all. All the three, you can see that when the hidden size increases, which means that the network is more over parameterized, the, the catastrophic forgetting decreases. Uh, so this result kind of shows that when the neural net, when the hidden size tends to infinity, the there is less and uh, less forgetting. Uh, the reason we couldn't do experiments for larger hidden sizes is the memory issues. Uh, because we needed to store the gradients of the OGD, and so it means storing the whole neural network like uh, a thousand times or more. And so we encountered encountered some memory issues. That's why we couldn't scale more. Uh, but it's kind of uh, we try to uh, run experiments to as much as as high as possible. Um, yeah. So this is the illustration of the this theoretical results. Uh, so if I come back to the contribution, so the first contribution was the convergence. Uh, so that's the first result I showed here. Uh, the second result is catastrophic forgetting, which is, uh, so I uh, showed you that, uh, how we proved that OGD is probably robust to catastrophic forgetting. Uh, now the third result is uh, generalization. So now we, uh, what we did is we proved uh, some generalization bounds for OGD and we showed that they are better or tighter than SGT. Uh, so this is the result I will show now. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, I'll go step by step. Uh, so uh, the top two lines, uh, so the first line is uh, the bound for OGD and second line is the bound for SGD. Uh, so as you can see, um, so the term we bound is the population loss or the test error. 
so uh, there are four terms, four key terms. There is a brown term, uh, green, blue, and uh, black. Uh, so uh, first, you see that uh, OGD and SGD share the same uh, three terms, green, uh, uh, blue, and uh, black. I will go through each of them uh, uh, one by one. But first, I'll start with the brown term, which is equals to zero in OGD, but um, looks maybe different from zero for SGD. Uh, so this term is related to the Fourier uh, so the reason it's equal to zero for uh, OGD is that because there is no forgetting in OGD, but in SGD there is forgetting, so this term appears. Uh, so now we're going to study the intuition behind the brown term, uh, which is related to uh, no forgetting for OGD or there is forgetting for SGD. Uh, so um, yeah, there's a question. Yeah, so there's another question. Oh, yeah. Um, you want to speak directly? Yeah, okay. So, like in, in previous slide, like there was one like bar chart. Uh, can you can you move to the previous slide? Where, like, yeah. like there is hidden size. Yeah. So, here, like for the assumption of that linearity, uh, like the weights change linearly when this uh, number of hidden size increases so that for that assumption to be true like uh, like earlier you said that the weights should be like very large in millions or like at least in thousands or something so and here like mm -hmm. hidden sizes uh, like in hundreds so uh, like doesn't uh, this contradict the uh, previous assumption on which like this theory is based uh, yeah it's a very good question so actually uh, it's a hidden size but it's an mlp so uh, when you increase the hidden size, the uh, number of weights increases quadratically because it's a matrix multiplication. Uh, so when we double the hidden size, uh, it's a very good question, but I don't have the numbers with me. Uh, so uh, if I recall more or less, so uh, 400 uh, hidden size was, I think, if I recall, it was like a million parameters, I think, uh, if I remember, or maybe 700 thousands. Uh, so uh, I agree that 100 is not uh, is very small. It's clearly not overparameterized, and you can see that the uh, there is forgetting. Uh, so I, I agree with you that uh, 400. So we we didn't we don't have a lower bound to quantify uh, from which hidden size uh, from which number of parameters we are in the overparameterized regime, uh, but. Uh, what we try to show in this plot is more a trend. So we try to show that the more uh, the uh, number of weights, the, uh, the larger the overparameterization and the more accurate the linear approximation is. Uh, but I agree that probably uh, it's not linear uh, because we see that there is forgetting, but we just try to get closer from this linearity. Uh, it's a very good point and I think uh, uh, so we tried to increase the number of parameters, but the challenge was the memory uh, for OGD because uh, it's an algorithm that stores the neural network multiple times. And uh, so the challenge was uh, to find the trade-off between uh, running a long continual learning experiment and uh, increasing the size of the neural network. But uh, your point is totally right. Uh, it, it's not... Uh, a linear neural, uh, the neural network is not yet linear at 400 because you can still see forgetting. I'm not sure I answered your concern. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for your question. Yeah, uh, so I just come back to the generalization bound. Uh, so here, uh, so uh, as I said, so there are four terms. Uh, here we we'll focus on the brown term. <laughs> and uh, so the brown term uh, is related to forgetting. Uh, it's equal to zero for OGD, and it could be different from zero for SGD. Uh, so here we try to see what this term uh, is equal to. Uh, so you can see that uh, HKTO, which is the brown term, uh, has uh, also the residual we talked about before. Uh, so I don't know if you remember, but the residual captures uh, how much the previous knowledge, so it tells you how much the model we trained before is able to predict the current task. Uh, so if the tasks are equal, then the model would, be, uh, this residual will be equal to zero. And so uh, there is no learning and no forgetting neither because the model didn't change. 
Uh, so here the intuition is that if the mo previous model predicts perfectly the next, the next tasks, uh, the residual equals to zero, the model doesn't change. And since there is no learning, uh, there is no memory, uh, no memory is erased. And so there is uh, no forgetting. Uh, so uh, now I will, uh, so the brown term, uh, the green term is related to regularization. Uh, here there is a lambda. Uh, this regularization is the square loss regularization. Uh, it's like a, a square regularization. Uh, so when we do regular, when we add a regularization, we uh, drift away the model from the actually what we want to learn. Uh, so this adds uh, some generalization error because the model doesn't learn actually what we wanted. Uh, the, uh, the third term is uh, related to write the macro bound, and I will explain it in the next uh, slide. So it's the blue term. Uh, so if we look at the blue term, uh, it may look uh, complex, but actually the intuition is very simple. So what this uh, bound tracks is how much the weights uh, change from one task to the other. Uh, and it bounds uh, the space, uh, how like how large space uh, the model evolves in. And so if uh, the neural network moves to, uh, has the ability to move in a very large space, it's more likely to, uh, to generalize less because it could be very far away from the original, uh, because the complexity of the uh, function space is larger. Uh, so uh, in the paper, we actually uh, compute the weights variation in a closed form. And it's the term here in yellow. Uh, so again, uh, the residual term uh, appears. And so uh, again, if the residual equals to zero, uh, the weights don't change. And therefore, there is no weight variation. And so this right macro bound also equals to zero. Um, so uh, this term kind of captures how complex the, uh, so the more complex the pattern to learn. Uh, the more this term is going to be larger, and so the more this bound will be higher. Uh, so here, the like intuition is that the more similar the task to the previous task, the smaller the, the residual, and uh, if the residual is small, uh, the network doesn't have to go too far away from the initial weights to learn because it doesn't have so much to learn. It just needs to learn a little to complete what it learned, and so the the bound would be small. Uh, so here, uh, so this is the intuition behind uh, the bound. It's uh, very simple. Uh, yeah, let me know if you have uh, any questions. Uh, and one last thing is that if the more you have a train size, a large train size, uh, the less you have overfitting. Uh, so because you have more samples to map your space. Uh, so uh, this is the end of the theoretical parts. Uh, the next part is more experimental. Uh, so. Uh, all the theory was based on the NTK regime assumption, uh, but this assumption, first, it may not be hold in practice. And what we try to see is in the real continual learning benchmarks, does this assumption hold? Uh, if not, uh, what happens? And is uh, how like how much how like um, to which extent is this theory valid? Uh, so in order to study. Uh, uh, the, um, in order to study uh, how much OGD is, uh, how much the variation of the uh, feature map in practice impacts OGD, uh, we design an OGD plus algorithm, which is more designed towards an ablation study. Uh, so in the NTK theory, uh, uh, this term is constant. Uh, if you have very large neural networks, but since uh, in practice it may not hold, this term may change. And so we uh, design like OGD plus, which is a small variant of OGD. Uh, the only difference is uh, that we account for the variation of the uh, gradients. Uh, so how do we do that? We just, uh, uh, when we update the S, which is our memory of gradients, uh, we uh, we don't only update it with the last uh, task. We recompute the gradients over all tasks uh, with the latest gradients. Uh, so if the gradient didn't change, uh, this wouldn't change anything because uh, the gradient would be the same. But if the gradient changes, it may matter because uh, we, we would uh, update the gradient over, for example, the first sample from the first task uh, with the latest gradients over the sample. And, and uh, so basically, if we have uh, the same result for OGD and OGD plus, this would mean that uh, 
uh, this variation doesn't matter or it didn't happen. Uh, but if we have different results, it would mean that it matters and the OGD uh, fails in case uh, this changes. Uh, <coughs> uh, so we do some sort of ablation study. Uh, here we define overparameterization as the number of parameters um, in bound over uh, the, the sum of the train set sizes of all tasks. Uh, so the larger uh, this term, the more uh, overparameterizes the models. Uh, we compute this metric for uh, the, like some common continuous learning uh, uh, benchmarks. Uh, for example, permuted MNIST uh, and rotate, rotated MNIST, uh, we uh, computed the overparameterization for some model and we have uh, true. And for split stack R it was 28 because the data set size is uh, smaller. And for cube uh, 200, the data set size is even smaller. And so the overparameterization was uh, even larger. Uh, so here we, we see that uh, if the, the for small overparameterization, uh, OGT plus has less uh, average forgetting than OGD. Uh, but when the overparameterization like is more than uh, 28, uh, there is no significant statistical dif uh, statistical uh, difference between the two average forgettings. Uh, so this result, what it suggests is that uh, for this overparameterization, the neural network is already overparameterized, and so uh, for this setting, and so accounting for the variation of the gradient doesn't matter because it's already over front rise and it's probably constants. But for these settings, it suggests that uh, these settings are more challenging because they're not over parameterized. And so uh, it's important to account for the variation of the gradients uh, because uh, the results, uh, because the, the function, the neural network is not really linear. And so if it's not linear, uh, the projection doesn't protects the model from all changes, it just protects some part of it. And so uh, if we account for how much the gradient varies, we can protect the model more. Uh, I'm not sure this was, uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, on this uh, part. Um, I'm not sure if it was clear. Yeah. Uh, so, and actually the last result is, uh, so even though we designed OGD plus more for an ablation study, we still compared it to the other baselines uh, just for completion. <coughs> and so we find that, uh, so for the overparameterized uh, settings, the performance is the same as OGD because uh, it's, it's kind of the same thing. So uh, it's not really competitive. Uh, to the, uh, it's more or less, I mean, uh, it's not state of the art compared to uh, the other baselines. Uh, for the uh, permuted MNIST and rotated MNIST uh, baselines, uh, here uh, they are less overparameterized. And in this case, OGT plus uh, brings some uh, value, uh, brings some additional value. And so uh, uh, for the permuted MNIST, it gets it to a bit like uh, more than the other baselines. And for rotated MNIST, it's competitive with the uh, state of the arts in our benchmarks. Uh, so this is the, the last uh, part of the, uh, the last contribution. So uh, at the end, there are just some take home messages. So uh, as we showed, so there are like, there are two results, one for the NTK regime. So we first presented a theoretical framework, for continuing learning. There are many tools to study what's happening, like how the ways change, how transfer happens. Uh, uh, so we find uh, it can be expressed as some recursive uh, linear combination. Uh, we find that OGD is probably robust because we forget in, in the NTK regime. And uh, it presents a tighter generalization bound because it has no forgetting. Uh, in practice, we find that for some settings, they're already overparameterized. So the variation, there is no variation of the NTK. But for some other settings like permuted and rotated MNIST, these settings are not overparameterized. And we see that the variation of the NTK brings for cutting for the OGD algorithm. So it's important to take it into account. Sorry. And uh, so some open problems. Uh, so uh, as you can, as you saw the, 
framework more or less explained captured what's happened in the overparameterized setting, but the non-overparameterized setting is more difficult because the model is not linear. So we are not sure how valid this framework, uh, I mean, to what extent uh, this framework is applicable to the settings. Uh, uh, then, uh, so it may be interesting to try to apply this framework to study properties of other continuous learning uh, methods. And actually, uh, HM is kind of related to OGD. Uh, and in the appendix of the paper, uh, there are some notes on how related it is to OGD. Uh, it may be interesting to dive deeper into this direction because there are some uh, connections. And uh, it may be interesting to maybe adapt the framework to study HM. And uh, so last uh, part. Uh, so actually, this framework was applied in another paper, follow-up paper, to study catastrophic forgetting as a phenomenon. Uh, and it's uh, this paper. Uh, and so if you are interested in just catastrophic forgetting, uh, how to explain it, uh, this paper studies uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, problem, this phenomena, and it's a follow-up of uh, this work. And uh, uh, throughout the presentation, I talked about some sort of transfer learning, and uh, maybe it would be possible to dive deeper in this direction with this framework. And another thing is that usually in continuous learning, we the upper, uh, the best baseline is the multitask learning because we basically you have all information. It may be interesting to study maybe multitask learning also with a similar approach. And uh, so there are some references, and uh, yeah, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Medi, for this very interesting presentation. I think that uh, there, uh, now you can see also the, the chat, right? Uh, uh, I need to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, can I stop sharing? Yeah, you, you can, yeah. I mean, uh, let's see. Okay, if, sure. uh, there's a question that, uh, you know, uh, requires uh, you to showing and uh, again the slides, but uh, maybe we can discuss uh, this way for now. Uh, so yeah, sure. uh, I invite all the people here to ask the questions. They can ask them uh, directly to Medi, or they can invite them in the chat as you please. Uh, maybe I can start with, with just um, a simple question. So uh, this ODG algorithm that you were proposing. Um, uh, have you tried uh, to assess um, the somehow efficiency and scalability of this algorithm? Um, uh, it, you know, it, maybe within your experimental evaluation, uh, in comparison with SGP? Uh, uh, yeah, actually, uh, the algorithm doesn't scale in terms of uh, memory, and it's uh, one of the main uh, limits of the algorithm. Uh, because uh, basically, the algorithm stores the neural network multiple times. And uh, for very large okay. network, it's just not possible. And so uh, this is one limit of the OGT and uh, also OGT plus because it's a small modification. Uh, they don't scale to very large uh, neural networks. And so even for the sci-fi experiments, we're not able to run them with ResNet because it's too large. So we did some transfer learning and uh, did uh, continue learning on the trend on the like uh, top layer because otherwise it uh, didn't scale. So uh, yeah, this is one limit. And it may be also interesting to investigate maybe how to change this algorithm to uh, go beyond this issue. Yeah, so do, do you have some ideas on how to tackle this problem and improve your algorithm for the next, your next research? Uh, yes, uh, actually, so there is a follow-up paper of this paper which uh, studies, this, uh, studies this issue. Uh, it's the uh, catastrophic forgetting paper. It's uh, at the, in this paper they study catastrophic forgetting, and uh, they uh, the, so uh, the idea is to uh, do uh, like SVD or PCA of the uh, gradients, and so in, uh, so the idea is to store smarter the gradients. Uh, I mean, in a more efficient way uh, by not picking gradients uh, randomly, but by compressing the information with the PCA and just keeping the top components. Uh, so this paper does uh, this, and uh, it's one way, but it still doesn't scale to very large uh, models. Uh, I don't have, uh, uh, 
like ideas on how to do better. But, but I read some works, uh, recent works uh, that uh, study how to do orthogonality in the activation space. Mm -hmm. And they even compare themselves to OGD. Uh, it, yeah, I think it may be interesting to look into these papers. Uh, I'm not familiar, I didn't read it in detail, but it, it could be in, uh, uh, like an approach that could maybe complement the OGD and OGD plus approaches. Mm -hmm. Um, All right, any other questions? Uh, we have a comment uh, by Irina in the chat. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I could. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, it's just kind of uh, random thoughts. I mean, when you were talking about over parameterized regime, right, and actually showing that, uh, I mean, you're becoming closer to a uh, linear uh, predictor, essentially, right? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, so it immediately made me think about this recent uh, scaling loss papers you probably might have seen uh, from um, Jared Kaplan, I think, uh, Jim, uh, Jim Hopkins. There are several papers uh, studying empirically how performance of different models um, scales with data, model size, and amount of compute, oh, including model size. And uh, they keep observing power laws, and it's kind of interesting meta approach to studying how different uh, approaches and models will compare and algorithms. But yeah, it's interesting insight that uh, at least if they're going to scale, well, how wide this will apply to, I guess it, it applies to the kind of supervised learning type of prediction. So ba basically, yeah, it's, it's kind of... Um, mind-boggling that indeed you get over-parameterized highly nonlinear network closer and closer to linear predictor. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, but actually, I'm not familiar with this work. Uh, could you, uh, it's, it looks very interesting. Uh, could you um, summarize yeah. it a little bit? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. There is one link I, I put it uh, there. So basically, there are several recent papers um, and a few papers in the past. It seems to be kind of recently um, evolving kind of hot topic. Uh, it started this, this year with analysis of GPT-K, basically GPT-2, GPT-3, uh, because essentially the main part there was scaling model size, data, and compute. And uh, essentially the papers are more like empirical analysis of um, performance of different methods and uh, looking at the um, scaling laws and they turn out to be frequently power law. Uh, and I guess the interesting point behind those papers was to see if you propose different learning algorithms, it would be interesting to compare them in the asymptotic regime and see which one maybe is worse, investing more kind of compute and so on, which one gonna outperform the others in a kind of large scale regime. But anyway, so it was kind of also interesting why they keep observing power laws when analyzing um, Kind of performance of this language models, then autoregressive, um, uh, basically the autoregressive generative models. That's a paper I linked in the chat. And so basically, it's called scaling laws for autoregressive generative modeling and uh, references therein, I would say. And Jared Kaplan um, in uh, John Hopkins. He was kind of on all those papers together with some folks from OpenAI. A anyway, so I mean, there are many interesting questions here about just kind of scaling behavior of different learning algorithms, but if all of them are gonna tend to linear, kind of well approximated by linear predictors, at least in terms of model size growing, that's quite interesting. And that was, yeah. I was wondering when you mentioned power law, it's the power law of uh, what is the what is the x and y? Yeah, so y axis is performance accuracy, mm -hmm. uh, basically loss, uh, and uh, x axis is either data set size or the model size or the computer, oh, okay. right? Okay. And uh, basically improving performance uh, as you scale uh, data model. And well, just among computer and um, I used to train it. Um, so roughly that, but yeah. So the the loss, the performance is the y-axis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, 
And there were some earlier papers. I actually still need to take a closer look at that. But uh, some people at Miller were quite interested in better understanding, first of all, when the scaling follows or doesn't follow power law and why and what the exponent of power law depends on and things like that. But anyway, it was kind of an interesting uh, meta view to compare different models in the different regimes of small data, large data. And I think it's very much applicable to continual learning because asymptotically you should have kind of uh, yeah, infinite yeah, amounts of data. Awesome. Yeah. But the scaling in terms of number of parameters and uh, yeah, so that that model can be yeah. or may help to analyze that better. I don't know. It just I'm just uh, kind of thinking about uh, yeah, it's very interesting, but, but I think uh, one challenge is like uh, 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 even though you increase the number of parameters, is to study how uh, like the architecture as a parameter, and uh, how does the architecture uh, like uh, influence? Uh, maybe some architectures are more yeah. prone to, uh, and this is uh, to my knowledge is an open problem, but it's a very interesting problem. Uh, because even in the analysis, you just uh, write a gradient, and the gradient is on. Uh, so it actually captures all the complexity in one term, uh, and all the nonlinearity is there. But you don't really know when it's supposed to work or not. Yeah. And so it, it could be really interesting to understand why. Right. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I think it's a very interesting research problem. Yeah, yeah, because indeed this is just number of parameters, but uh, there is lots of variation due to how those parameters enter the architecture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it could be really interesting to, uh, but I also think it's very, I mean, to my knowledge, there are no theoretical works uh, from what I saw that connect. I mean, no, there are some works on how virus networks, how why transformers work. Right. Uh, so maybe, uh, I'm not familiar with this literature, but maybe it could be a direction to look into these works yes. and look into, like over and optimization indeed, and try to, yeah. yeah. The, the first scaling paper, the, I mean, the, the NLP model scaling paper was indeed about transformers because it was about GPT-K uh, type of models. Yeah. Oh, which yeah. paper is it? Sorry. Okay, uh, let me, it, it's the same author. Uh, uh, let me just give you a link very quickly. So it's also about uh, research for scaling laws and I guess GPT-3 and I guess Jared Kaplan, you probably will find it, or maybe even smaller search. So, yeah. Yeah, it was okay. Scaling laws for neural language models. I can give you the link in the chat. And the other link in the chat I gave just before was a later paper, roughly same set of authors on scaling laws for um, autoregressive generative models. So essentially, they're analyzing different classes of uh, models. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, they keep finding power laws as a function of data set size and uh, model size and, and compute. But I mean, um, I have to admit, I have to read the papers more carefully because I mean, they're kind of comparison. There are some interesting and strange things about why scaling doesn't seem to be in some cases affected by type of the data that match. Like, supposedly richer video data seem to have like similar scaling uh, as, um, I mean, models on this data and models on just images. Anyway, I mean, the papers definitely deserve some more attention in machine learning community, I would say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. And so uh, I'm just curious, yeah, uh, I was just curious because you mentioned there was a counter example, uh, which was it? Uh, because okay. it seems like there was a trend uh, like a pattern in how the neural networks behave. Uh, I, it seems you mentioned the counter example in which the, this data setting doesn't uh, behave with the power law. Uh, uh, oh, okay. so, oh, so there are some settings. Um, again, I, as I said, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think there are settings where performance does not behave as power law. Uh, oh, okay. I, don't remember it, I don't remember it on the top of my head. And um, we can, we can definitely, I would be happy to, Kind of discuss it further. I just didn't want to hijack the whole discussion. Yeah, okay. And uh, there is, a, there is a more papers apparently to dig out. There is some history before those recent scaling loss papers also trying to study how performance scales um, with data and model size and so on. 
from even okay. several years ago. So, so that's um, yeah. But I think it's it might be quite interesting. And continual learning is a specific case of the scaling because you do scale with the data, and potentially you can increase your model. But uh, the access to the data is only sequential, while those scaling loss papers like GPT. Uh, three and um, they're all in classical setting that the data available simultaneously and it might be very different type of scaling oh so, okay I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know yeah yeah it's so, interesting um, yeah, uh, yeah I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to continue discussion offline as well yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah me too um, maybe we, yeah if, uh, maybe we shouldn't hijack the conversation yeah. No problem. I think uh, I mean the conversation was very on point. I mean on the whole topic of continual learning. Actually, I I think that that mm -hmm. reference is is very useful, and we will use it in our paper in continual learning because you know this idea of scaling and how it relates to this dilution yeah. of learning over time is very it's very connected. And so thank you so much, Irina, for bringing that up. Uh, I see that there are another few questions possibly uh, from the chat, I see Kartik with the hand raised. So if you want, you can yeah. ask a question, Kartik. Yeah, so maybe, I mean, this question uh, I might, might have already been asked because uh, I was not there for a few minutes. Uh, so uh, when you said that there are tasks that are presented, the model that is learned, let's say I permuted the order, would the exact same uh, f like recursive formulation still appear like would I get the recover the same model if I even present uh, tasks in a different order? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. And actually the answer is uh, no. Uh, I'll just share my screen again to uh, show to show you the equations that uh, yeah, yeah, my screen. Yeah, yeah, before, before uh, that, I will also add to this question. So if the ordering is not the same, it seems like catastrophic forgetting is defined with respect to the task at a certain uh, like time. So like you're you're not gonna change. Like so, it really depends on what per permutation was given, right? So catastrophic yes. forgetting, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. The answer. Yeah. Uh, so catastrophic forgetting depends on the permutation of ta uh, tasks uh, on the order of tasks. Uh, so uh, yeah. So I'm so not. The thing is. So I'm not that familiar with the literature. So it seems like, is it like a standard notion to even uh, say that even if you change the order in one, you might learn a different model. And then with respect to that, you would not want to forget. Is that, uh, that seems a bit counterintuitive. So I just wanted to ask you about your thoughts about permutation. So now you can say, I just wanted to complete my question. So yeah. Oh uh, Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no, no. So uh, it's very, yeah. Uh, it's very good question. And actually, so the catastrophic forgetting depends on the permutation. In this paper, we don't really study catastrophic forgetting deeper. Uh, we just, uh, uh, we, it's more about the framework. Uh, so the follow-up paper, which is more about catastrophic forgetting, actually, uh, we uh, have results that show that, uh, uh, so the way the order is important is that, um, uh, so the thing is, so so the, uh, so what happens is uh, you have a sequence of tasks, and uh, so when you learn a new task, it, it erases uh, some things in the memory. And uh, if you learn a task after it, that kind of is closer to a task before, it may re help you recover. But if you didn't put this task at the end, that might help you recover uh, from the previous task, you may not recover. Uh, an intuitive example is rotated MNIST. So rotated MNIST, uh, imagine you have uh, 10 tasks from 5, 10, 15 to 50. Uh, so if you do a permutation like 5, 10, uh, the, like basic permutation, 5, 10 to 50, in this case, um, what you would observe is that, uh, uh, so like five, 10 is very close from 5, so you don't really forget that much, and uh, 15 is very close from 10, so you don't forget as much, but you forget some bits from 5. But if you train the model like uh, 5, 10 to 50, and you know, like if you do 10 to 50, and you put 5 again at the beginning, what you would see is that uh, the task 10, even though you forgot it at task uh, which at the task in which the angle is 50 because you it's too different, but since you put another task that is very similar at the end, which is task uh, uh, five uh, with the angle five, uh, the task with angle five is very similar to the task with angle 10, and uh, so it would help you learn again 
uh, not exactly task time, but something that is so close that it uh, you will see that the perform uh, the test performance of task uh, with Angleton increases. And uh, so in this paper, we don't really study that, but the follow-up paper uh, uh, actually uh, it's um, I would yeah, recommend yeah, I uh, so yeah. to this question. Yeah, and, so, uh, so I have a follow-up uh, to that. So now it seems like you want some type of periodicity in terms of what you would like to show, right? Because otherwise, what uh, that's what I'm sensing, right? Like because otherwise, you would forget. Uh, isn't it? Um, uh, by periodicity, you mean smoothness? Uh, so uh, let, let, let's like say you, show, you showed a task of type A, and then you show a task, very different task, and then you never show a task of type A again, then it seems like your framework would work, but it only works uh, because of the permute, like the, the order, but like no. it seems like the order in which you present seems quite crucial for for what really would like, I mean, the gen, like what the general term for getting would mean, right? So you would want to present the task again and again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so for example, if you do an order like five, 25, 50, 10, uh, 10, 30, uh, 60, uh, it's periodic. But the thing is, even though it's periodic, at the end, you have a task that kind of removes everything behind. Uh, so, so actually, it's more like a Markov. Uh, I mean, how to say? It? it only depends on the previous results. And if you put something that is too opposite, too opposed to all that you learned, it will just erase everything. So whatever the order before was, uh, it cannot protect you from the next thing because it just uh, if it's opposed to everything before. So for example, if you do any permutation of a rotated MNIST between zero and fifty, and then at the end you put rotated MNIST uh, one twenty. Uh, it's so different. It will just destroy everything before whatever the order you put. Uh, this is uh, for SGD, not even for OGD. Right, uh, right. Actually, you can show it. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, I'm saying like all of these could be uh, hacked with bad permutations, basically. Uh, yeah. If you do some adversarial task that is uh, uh, adversarial to what you learned, uh, you can do anything. I mean, right. at least from the experiments uh, we saw yeah, yeah. when yeah. we did the uh, second. Uh... Yeah, yeah, because that is the part I got a bit confused. Because when in theorem you say that uh, there is no catastrophic forgetting, it kind of implicitly is assuming you're kind of giving a nice permutation. Uh, oh, uh, no, no, no. So actually, this result is general. And uh, so, OK, sorry. So the, the things I was talking about were for the SGD algorithm or for the OGD algorithm in the non-NTK regime setting, in which it's not uh, perfectly robust. Uh, but this result, uh, sorry, uh, the, this uh, result is actually valid. Uh, no, not this one. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, this result is actually valid, whatever the permutation. Uh, the reason it works is that the model uh, actually uh, memorizes precisely, I mean, uh, so it keeps the patterns, and when uh, you learn something new, it's, it learns in an orthogonal space. So the model right. still has everything it learns. So this is permutation and this, invariant. Like they, whatever you would learn for a certain task tau, it would not have mattered what you gave before tau minus one. Yes. Yeah, exactly. OK, so this yeah, part It's is, a very extreme case. OK, OK, so this is permutation invariant, uh, whatever you learn here. It would not matter yeah. how you gave the task. You would finally yes. always learn the this model. F star tau does not depend on the permutations. Yes, exactly. Uh, in this oh. setting, uh, but it's a theoretical setting in which the the thing is linear. So when it's linear, it's permutation independent. Okay. Unless okay. yeah, unless that's you want. pick a sample and you give the opposite label. Uh, in this case, you would erase the previous thing because the sample is the same. Uh, but if you keep giving different samples, uh, if you just give a sample plus epsilon, it would still be different and uh, it would still be robust. But if you learn, if you give like X a label in the first task and then uh, the second task, you give it a different label. In this case, it would forget because it would uh, erase the label. But if you just add a small epsilon to the pr previous sample, it would not erase it because it's the, it's a different sample and the feature map is different. And so the learning is in another space. Okay. So this is a uh, permutation invariant. Yeah. Okay. But it's a very good question. Thank you. I just wanted to understand that. Thank you. Yeah, sure.
Yeah, maybe we can have one last question uh, from Arash. Arash, if you want, you can. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Mehdi, for the great talk. I learned so much. Uh, so uh, uh, this is my first time uh, learning about OGT. So uh, if you allow me uh, to summarize it, uh, and I have something to add uh, from my understanding. So from the original paper, uh, there is this uh, vector uh, diagram which says that uh, at the current uh, task gradient, so uh, up to task tau, we learn a gradient uh, and try to uh, orthogonalize the next gradient uh, to this one. So if we get a, a new gradient for a new task, so this is the gradient up to tau. Now this is uh, the new gradient from the new task. So what uh, we are trying to do is subtract uh, this from this to get uh, a kind of orthogonal version of it and then update with this corrected um, gradient, right? So am I good so, so far? OK, so uh, I was wondering, since everything's linear because in the NTK domain, uh, why can't we, instead of, for example, uh, remembering, so the problem is, uh, learning or uh, calculating this gradient of the entire previous history, right? So this is the tricky part. So the OGD plus and OGD uh, original have this difference, right? In the OGD yes. plus, we remember all the samples from before to uh, calculate this better, right? Yes. So I was thinking since that is a uh, very memory inefficient, so what can, why can't we do something linear and recursive that doesn't require memory. Like uh, this is on top of my head from geometry. So why don't we just update it uh, from the previous one? Uh, let's say this is the previous one. And then we update it uh, uh, with the just, uh, um, so this is the previous one. We can update it just with the before, uh, with something with exponential uh, filters. Uh, oops, sorry. So we update, um, with a uh, new gradient uh, and with some uh, le with some remembering factor, for example, right? So this would be uh, OK. I think you don't see this. Maybe it would be better. I write it down. So some kind of uh, update rule for the uh, history gradient uh, like this uh, with the remembering factor R uh, of the uh, previous uh, gradient. And then uh, with something from the new gradient, right? Uh, maybe something like this. Would it make sense? So this way it will be recursive. We don't need to have all the samples from the uh, previous history. We will just need to remember the previous gradient, previous uh, tasks gradient, and uh, just the new gradient and somehow oh. updated a little. For example, like uh, this, like just uh, make this a bit closer to uh, this uh, in in linear terms. So something like this. Sorry for my bad drawing here, but like, you know, just uh, shifting the uh, entire history gradient a little towards the new gradient instead of recalculating it entirely from the previous sample. Uh, so maybe uh, it's stupid, but I have no idea. This like uh, intuition came to me. I wanted to ask your idea. Uh, yeah, I get it. So it's very interesting. Uh, the thing is, uh, what I'm worried about is that uh, so when you get very close, uh, so the problem is that the space, the size, the dimension of the space spanned by the gradients. So it's kind of critical. Uh, so I see that if you're trying to find an average of the gradients so that you don't store more, but you try to get in the middle ground. Uh, so in this case, maybe it would work. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, so in theory it doesn't. Uh, so so if you try to prove that it would work, uh, I can't see how to prove it because the thing is you are in the middle, so you would have forgotten. Uh, mm -hmm. But maybe in practice it could still work because it's some sort of approximation. And uh, in case you don't have too much memory, maybe it's a very smart approximation which would help you in practice find a good trade-off. So it Great. looks like a good idea to me. But uh, uh, I think it should uh, maybe it would be worth like running an experiment and uh, checking the results. 
Uh, cool, thank the, you. I don't, uh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I don't have, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. But it looks uh, a good idea. But, uh, the thing is, uh, the problem with uh, the method is more, even if you store one grade, I mean, if you scale to very large model, like uh, like tens of millions, uh, uh, the problem is more in the number of tasks, but if you manage to always store a very small number of gradients, it could be like a way to solve it maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it could, could be worth trying, like trying an experiment. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. Thank uh, you so much, Aresh, uh, for your question. Uh, we enjoyed also the writing part on the screen. <laughs> uh, do you have a glass in front of you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a light board uh, studio. <laughs> uh, wonderful, wonderful. All right, uh, so thank you all for joining for this uh, reading group session. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion, especially today. Yeah, it was very long. I hope you, you enjoyed it too. And I invite you to follow the next reading group session next week at the same time. Uh, we're not sure uh, who is going to present, so if you have any ideas, of course, you can just send me a message if you want to present your paper or, or you want to suggest a paper please do it so and i'll see you next week so thank you so much again and see you thank you maddie thanks so much uh, thanks so much for inviting me okay, <clears throat>